Welcome to our discussion of the 2012 August uh, crop report. I'm uh, Jay Ackridge. I'm Dean of the College of Agriculture at Purdue, and I'll be uh, moderating our session this morning. Uh, we, were, we were talking a bit earlier, and we've done this uh, for a number of years, and normally it's a, uh, it's a quiet little event over in the Arland Pavilion, and uh, about half the audience was usually waiting for the, uh, the surgery you know, that the, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine was doing. But uh, I, I think it's fair to say this year the entire world has been waiting for, uh, for this uh, crop report. All of us know this summer has been a story of a heat and drought, and both of those factors I think are important in explaining uh, what's gone on. Our state climatologist says we are five to 11 of inches of rain short since uh, April 1st. And uh, most of the state, of course, is in extreme or exceptional drought. And I think we've got a chart over there that, that shows that. Uh, on Monday, our colleagues at NAS, the National Ag Statistics Service, uh, reported that about 89% of the subsoil, or not, the topsoil, and 95% of the subsoil was short or very short in moisture. And to combine, uh, you know, to make things, of course, worse, uh, we had heat in addition to drought and the hottest July on, on record. And as a result, NAS reported Monday that 73% uh, of the corn was in a poor, or very poor condition in this state, and 53% of the soybeans were in poor, very poor uh, condition. So this morning, we're going to hear what that's going to mean for yield, and also uh, discussing some of the uh, the economics and the production implications. I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we're going to hear from each of these individuals in turn. Uh, we'll open it up for some questions. Uh, if you're with the media, these folks will be available for interviews immediately following the session. And I'm also uh, asked to tell you that there will be press packets available at the close of the session as well. So and I'll just uh, start on my immediate left, Greg Matley, who's Deputy Director of the National Ag Statistics Service, will give us an overview of the report. Uh, then we're going to hear from Bob Nielsen, Extension Corn Specialist, and uh, his colleague, Sean Castile, Extension Soybean Specialist. Uh, Chris Hurt, Extension Economist, will be talking to us about the economic implications of the report. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Joe Kelsey, a Director of the Indiana State Department of Agriculture and a Johnson County Dairy Farmer, to talk to us a bit about some of the broader implications. So that's our format, and we'll immediately get into the report and turn things over to Greg. Thank you, Jay. Um, the, the crop report came out this morning. Corn production for the United States down 13% from 2011. Uh, the crop forecast is 10.8 billion bushels, which is down 13%. That's the lowest production since 2006. Um, average yield for the United States is 123.4 bushels. That's down 23.8 bushels from last year. Last year's yield for the United States was 147.2. Um, the acres harvested was 87.4 million acres. That's down 2% from the June forecast and up 4% from 2011. And all these numbers will be in that packet that Jay went over with you. Um, soybean production is forecast at 2.69 billion bushels. That's down 12% from last year. And these are all based on August 1 numbers. That gives an expected yield of 36.1 bushels, and that's down 5.4 bushels from a year ago. And that would be the lowest since 2003. Uh, everyone in this room is interested in what happened to Indiana. Well, based on conditions, August 1 in Indiana, uh, our corn production is forecast as 605.0 million bushels. That would be down 28% from the 83.9.5 bushels produced in 2011. And that gives you an expected yield of 100 bushels per acre. Uh, that's down 46 bushels from last year, or 32% below uh, the 2011 yield per acre. We do have 6.05 million acres for harvested. That's up 5% from last year. And uh, on August 1, which all the conditions are based on, we had 9% of the corn crop in good to excellent condition. And your packet will also have district level corn yield estimates. And if you notice on the drought map over here, you can see the part of the state that's devastated and 
If you look in the far southwest corner of the state, uh, the average yield for that far District 7 or the, the southwest is only 83 bushel to the acre. So uh, when you look at the maps, we'll have those available in the packet, you'll see how the drought has affected each of the districts throughout the state of Indiana. Uh, soybean production is forecast at 184.6 million bushels for Indiana. That's down 22% from the 238.1 million bushels in 2011. And that gives us an average yield of 37 bushels per acre. Uh, that's down 18% uh, from the 45 bushels we had last year. We have 5.29 million or 4.99 million acres uh, for harvest this year. That's 6% below the 5.29 million acres harvested last year. And these are all based on August 1 uh, conditions. The condition of the soybean crop was rated 16% good to excellent at that time. Um, this information is collected from farmers. I'd like to thank the farmers for allowing us to, to go out of their fields. We actually do two different surveys. We do a field survey and we do a farmer survey. The field survey is called our objective yield survey where we actually go out into the fields and take counts and measurements out in the field. And then we call a sample of farmers and actually ask them what they expect the yields to be. And that's how all of the USDA's numbers are calculated at this point in time. And they are based on an August 1 forecast, so uh, September 12th when the next crop report comes out, the numbers have a chance to change. Okay, thanks, Greg. Again, you'll have time for questions of Greg after we finish the panel. But let's, uh, let's hear a bit more about the corn crop and from our extension corn specialist, Bob Nielsen. All right, thanks, Jay. Um, you know, certainly, um, not only nationally, but, Indi but for Indiana, this is certainly an unprecedented departure from, from, um, from average. Um, if you go back 75 years, this is, will be the worst departure from trend yield in Indiana corn in the past 75 years. Um, the way, and we all sometimes calculate trend yields a little differently, but based on the trend yields that I use, this 100 bushel estimate is about 38% below trend. Um, and to put it in comparison uh, with some of the recent severe droughts, uh, the departure in 83 was 34% uh, below, so we're worse than, you know, than that. Uh, 1988, which is the drought we all talk about, we were 31% off, and then 1991 we were 27. So this is indeed unprecedented, and if you drive around the state, if you've done any driving around the state, you're certainly not surprised by it because it, it is pretty dramatic. But you know, we always look for uh, silver linings wherever we can in situations like this. And, and even though this crop is pretty far along in its development and, and it's now rapidly approaching maturity, um, there is still some limited opportunities with these late rains that we've begun to catch around the state uh, for some of these late, uh, uh, these crops that are near maturity to actually still uh, gain some limited benefit in terms of maybe some additional kernel weight uh, assuming that uh, a field is still in reasonably healthy condition. So it's probably a very limited benefit yet to be had in some of these fields, but, but I think there is at least a glimmer of hope that, that you know, perhaps uh, we'll get some benefit from some of these late rains. Um, just a couple issues I want to point out that we are yet facing this season. And as you can imagine, in, in this kind of a severe year, uh, there, it sort of leads to other issues. Uh, one of them that, uh, that we are concerned about is uh, relative to a particular ear mold uh, called aspergillus that tends to thrive under hot, dry conditions. And we worry about this particular ear mold in corn because it can produce a, a, a mycotoxin called aflatoxin, and you've probably heard of this kind of mycotoxin before. It's not a, a, a kind of a situation that's usually found in Indiana. It's really more of a southern U.S., a Texas kind of situation where it's typically hot and dry. But it, it infects the ears of corn uh, midway through the season, and if it develops, it can produce aflatoxins. And I think growers especially that have severely stressed fields need to be aware of this and, and need to be aware that uh, the grain elevators will likely be checking for it. And if you're feeding it yourself, you need to be aware and I think it's worth walking fields now looking for the presence of this olive green mold 
uh, doing some sending samples off to, to places like our animal disease diagnostic lab for analysis. So just be aware of that. Uh, the other issue that, that we've been dealing with for, for several weeks too is you know a lot of this drought stressed corn is being used for forage. It's being cut for silage. It's being uh, cut for, for feed for livestock, especially cattle. And drought stressed corn has a higher risk of having excessive levels of nitrate in the stalk tissue because of the fact that there's not much grain in this crop and that's a lot of this nitrogen is usually converted to protein in the grain and therefore if you don't have much grain you sort of accumulate nitrates in the stalk and that can be toxic to animals, especially cattle. So uh, I think we've done a good job at Purdue getting this information out and, and all of our local county extension educators are, are aware of it and have the resources to help folks deal with it. So again, just another issue that comes along in a year like this and, and that we have ways of managing it, but again, sort of like aflatoxin, we need to know if it's there, we need to analyze it and, and, and decide. The, the, another issue that, um, that grain producers need to be aware of is that, again, when you get into any kind of a severe stress like this after pollination during the grain field period, uh, the plants sometimes are stressed so severely that the, the photosynthetic factory just begins to shut down. And the plant will often respond by cannibalizing stored carbohydrates in the stalk tissue and moving them up to the ear, which is good for filling the ear. But that remobilization of stored carbohydrates weakens the stalk uh, physically, and it makes it more susceptible to stalk rot diseases. So there will be a much higher risk of weak stalks that may fall over easily in, in a uh, windstorm. There will be a higher risk of stalk rots, which will also make the plant weaker. So uh, another reason or another thing to be doing as, as you're walking fields is to check the integrity of that stalk. And if you're finding fields that are really becoming very weak and, and susceptible to breaking over, those fields need to be scheduled for an early harvest. Um, and then the harvest itself, there's, there's likely going to be issues just from the mechanical sides of things. Uh, not only do plants cannibalize the lower stalk, but they tend to cannibalize the, the ear shank that connects the, the ear to the plant. And so it makes that ear shank weaker. There's a higher risk of ears literally dropping off the plant before harvest, dropping off the plant as the, as the machinery hits it going through the field. And, 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 uh, and then along with that, um, uh, dry grain you know, will easily shatter going through as it hits the header. And, Folks need to be ready for an early harvest. This crop's going to mature sooner than normal, partly because we planted it earlier than normal. It was going to mature early anyway, and now it's going to mature probably even sooner because of the drought stress. It's probably going to mature at a drier moisture content than we normally see, and it's going to be maturing in August instead of September, and, it's, and so under much warmer conditions, it's going to dry faster in the field. And so it's going to get to a harvestable moisture content before we know it and may go beyond that before we know it. And there's certainly no reason to be harvesting corn below 15% moisture. So again, growers need to be aware and be ready for an early harvest if they're not already. And then um, uh, another factor with the harvest is that fields that have varying degrees of drought stress, there's also going to be varying sizes of cob, varying sizes of number of kernels on the cob, and in terms of making these machinery work efficiently, harvesting these fields, it's going to be a real challenge getting the settings on the combine set to manage a lot of variable cob sizes and, and variable kernel sets, so just be aware of that. And then the last comment I would make is, is not necessarily agronomic, but as I, as I drive around the state and I look at these fields that are just shutting down and, and turning brown and drying up, and then I look at the roadsides that are dry and brown, and I look at the lawns that are dry and brown, and I look at the trees that are dying and the shrubs that are dying, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, field fires. And the risk of field fires started by machinery sparks or field fires started by the, the, the unaware Joe Average going down the road and flipping out a cigarette stub or something, um, I, we need to be aware, I think, in some areas of the state that not only the risk of field fires to the field itself, but the risk of spreading into roadsides, into lawns, etc. So I think we all just need to be aware of that this fall, that there is this, this one of these side effects of a, of a severe drought like this is this higher risk of, or the consequences at least, of some field fires. So Jay, that's all I'll say at this point. Thanks much, Bob. Uh, let's uh, hear a bit about the soybean crop from uh, Sean Castile, Extension Soybean Specialist. Thank you, Jay. 
Uh, I just kind of want to recap uh, where we've been with soybeans this year uh, and looking at the forecast uh, that came out today for the state we're at 37 bushels uh, per acre and uh, our trend would be on the order of 48.7, 49 bushels so that puts us about 24 percent below uh, our trend yields. You look at 1988 uh, where we ended up was 28 percent off so we're not quite to that level. Uh, 1991, uh, and this is where beans have a lot of flexibility. In 1991, that drought, we were only off 2% in soybeans. And so uh, I say that with this year, I think we're in that in between at this point. Uh, there's still a fair amount of season left on soybeans, uh, potential to make up some ground uh, in terms of yield potential. Uh, across, uh, across the state, we're about a week ahead in terms of our normal growth and development. So we're, we're potting on about 70% of the acres at this point. And again, that's about a week ahead. If you look at 1988 and 1991, uh, this year, 2012, is a week behind those years. So in other words, 1988 and 1991, we're about two weeks ahead of a normal uh, development. And if you look at 1991, able to make up ground with August weather. So we're talking the first couple weeks of August. Uh, some rain came into that situation. We had temperatures that were a little more, a little more mild. So on the order of 90 degree highs instead of the 100, 105 degree highs that we had in 1988. And so if you look at, we have a little bit longer development window still with this year's crop. Uh, rains that have been coming uh, sporadically north central last night coming through the central southeast part of the state uh, those rains continue we can make up ground um, you look at the crop in june uh, a lot of the beans look the same height june 1st as they did june 30th uh, there wasn't a lot of vertical growth at that point our crop was putting more energy into root development and just kind of sustaining itself and as rains would come back we would have good vegetative growth, but we're not at a height that we're used to. So as you're driving the roadsides and you see a crop that maybe is only going to be thigh high, you're like, that's going to be short. I really want to impress upon our growers and crop professionals to get out there and look at them because a short bean crop in terms of stature does not mean that we're going to have a short crop in terms of yield. Uh, on the counter side, if we have tall beans, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get great yields either. So it's a matter of going out and looking at those fields. As so I've been driving around and stopping and looking, uh, there's fields that are up to my thigh, so 30 inches, 36 inches tall, that estimate probably about 30 bushel. And the same height on a field down the road, I was estimating 55, 60 bushel. So we can't just uh, count on drive-bys. We really need to go out and look at those fields. Uh, the other side of that is as we go out to get a, a yield estimate on those fields so we can help with the marketing side, but also as you prepare for the harvest. Uh, the reason to think about harvest is the fact of early season stress caused a lot of our beans to flower uh, lower on the pods, lower on the plants. So we're talking two or three inches on a lot of our plants that have pods at that height. And so getting a cutter bar across there is going to be uh, logistically very difficult, if at all. Uh, whereas if we're at three or four inches, we can get those, but we just have to slow our, our harvest root down. We have to slow combine harvest down. Uh, so just be aware where those are potting. The other side of it is in setting up the combine, we're going to have seed side variation. So seed size are going to be large. Uh, on a lot of those fields where maybe we've only retained a few pods, but now we're getting these August rains, which are great and help make up yield but then our seed size is going to be bigger, and so we need to make sure the combine's set for that. Whereas on the other side, we could have fields that retained a, a number of pods, and now maybe they aren't catching these August rains. So seed size could actually be smaller there. So it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all type of harvest. Uh, very similar to corn in terms of just being ready for harvest. I think that grain moisture is, is going to be pretty low fast, and so now we typically want to harvest soybeans above that 13 percent. Well, a lot of times in a normal year, we're lucky to get out there if it's 10, 11, 12 percent moisture, and we're losing yield there. Uh, I think that we really need to be timely with the harvest. Uh, if we've got a, a crop that's a little shorter than what we uh, anticipate, both in height and yield potential, let's do what we can to, to gain as much as possible with a timely harvest, not losing out on that water weight. So just kind of recapping again, 
This year, we've got a lot of potential still. We're off in terms of yield forecast, 24%, but uh, the next two weeks, uh, I think we can make up a lot of ground and still come even closer to trend yields. And there's gonna be areas that do quite well. And unfortunately, there's still gonna be areas that are gonna do quite poor. So, thank you, Jay. Thanks much, Sean. So, uh, Dr. Chris Hurt, Extension Economist, is gonna to talk to us a bit about some of the economic impacts of, uh, of what uh, Sean and, uh, and Bob have shared. Uh, thanks a lot, Jay. Well, it's uh, certainly a remarkable uh, low numbers here in terms of particularly the corn that we uh, looked at. I, my estimate was going into the report about 35% lower yields on corn uh, for Indiana. We're down about 40% from what we would have expected with a normal crop. Uh, so certainly uh, the corn, as you've already heard, that damage is, is done. And so one of the themes that we're all going to have to be aware of is the variability that we're going to have this year. And that variability uh, comes back to our farm families. And so I, I wanna kind of focus on that just a little bit. Uh, first thing when we're looking at variability, uh, the data that Greg and Indiana Ag Statistics have provided us here today uh, does reflect uh, the map that you see here and if you look at corn yields, uh, again, th these are running my trends. I had the southwest uh, part of the state um, at a trend yield of about 165 bushels this year, the 83 bushels, that's exactly one half of a crop on average, one half, 50% reduction. That's for an entire region. So I think what that tells us is that we do have farm families that uh, are far below uh, a half a crop. It's, it's, it's a dramatic uh, statement. Uh, the other one, as you can see on the, the uh, drought map that's uh, behind us here, is the west central part of the state. The west central part of the state is the highest yielding part of the state. I had a trend yield for this year, 174 bushels. Uh, Greg's uh, data and statisticians come up with 96. That's a 55% uh, reduction. I'm gonna do that number again. That, uh, sometimes my calculator makes a mistake. <clears throat> oh, I didn't make a mistake. That's a 45% uh, reduction. So I think those two areas are ones we wanna look at. That says the Southwest is the most affected area. Uh, Joe, as you look around uh, what you do in the state, I think we all are gonna to have to be aware that it regionally makes a difference and it farm to farm really makes a difference. Okay, as we look at this uh, kind of in a national perspective then, uh, we've had this big growing demand for our two big crops, corn and soybeans. This is not just Indiana, but it is nationally. And what you wanna do when you're a producer in the business, keep servicing that big demand growth. We're not gonna be able to serve that demand growth this year. We're going to have to tell the users of these two products, corn and soybeans, the two largest crops in the United States. Uh, there is not enough in the United States for you to continue to grow. In fact, we're going to have to cut back about 10 to 13%, depending on if you're looking at corn or soybeans, on your usage. So how is that going to happen? This is now one of the really big questions that's before uh, not only the marketplace, but even before uh, the EPA and trying to think through a little bit of some of their mandates, uh, um, working with the man ethanol mandates. Um, and I think the other part of that is who? Who is going to cut back on the usage? Where will the boat, the biggest, negative economic events uh, sectors uh, be. Um, let's see, as we, as we look at the revenue side, uh, really dismal in terms of the uh, yields, uh, and I think it's well worth mentioning that uh, if you're looking for where is it really bad regionally, we did that uh, on the map here and with some numbers. Uh, you could also ask the question, well, where is it really bad nationally? And guess where it is the worst of the major production states? Okay, we are here. So Indiana, uh, at least the corn I've looked at, 100 bushel corn, Illinois 116. There are usually a few bushels higher than us, but not hit as bad. They're, they're obviously hurt badly, but not as bad. Iowa, 141 bushels. 
Nebraska 147. So all of those states would be reasonably, you know, within roughly five bushels of each other. So we clearly uh, are the worst of it. We knew that going into the drought early on, that Indiana was the worst that really did spread to the west. And so uh, we are the most severe. Now, I'm gonna turn to a little more positive side and that is, uh, you know, we're all sort of assume that a producer has to have bushels in order to have income. But we economists every once in a while come up with a little twist on things that uh, surprises people. And that is to say that we have two important uh, opportunities for our farm families to get some compensation from what uh, on corn is a 40% loss and yield and, and um, soybeans about 25%. Uh, and that first thing is what we call the natural hedge. When you have a drought that impacts the entire Midwest, that lowers production on a broad base, on a national base, and what that of course means is that prices are higher. So uh, one of the aspects that is kind of surprising here is that while Indiana product, yield and production down about 40%, from where prices were back in the uh, spring. Expectation from their spring revenue uh, prices, I have them up about 64% now. So uh, what that means is that for what they have to sell, they may have an opportunity to sell for a higher price. Now that's gonna depend on some conditions I'm gonna mention here in a second. So we call that the natural hedge, lower production across the broad region gives higher prices. On soybeans, as I said, we're about 25% lower uh, on the way I do my calculations uh, for Indiana, but uh, prices about 24% higher versus what was expected in the spring. Just mentioned the USDA, uh, at least the mean of their estimate on prices of corn, the last year's crop, the 11 crop, 625 a bushel national price they now have at the mean they have a range for 2012 but eight dollars and 20 cents 625 average u.s farm price for the 11 crop eight dollars and 20 cents u.s average farm price estimate and that's the midpoint of a range that they give 820 Soybeans, $12.45 last year, $16 this year. Both of those are up about 30% on a national basis versus last year. So that is one of the compensations uh, that we're looking at. The second is crop insurance. So crop insurance is used, we think, by about uh, 65 to 75% of the corn and soybean acreage uh, here in the state of Indiana. Uh, I don't believe those numbers are out yet for 12, but this would be based on 11. And so those dollars of compensation uh, are going to be very, very large. So we look at the individual farms. There's some things we already know how you'll get huge ranges in farm income from very negative to maybe not impacted as much as you would guess this year on income. Their final yields, we've talked about that forward contracted. These higher prices, if they forward contracted at the lower prices in the spring, they can't gain any by the higher prices. What did the individual farm families do on crop insurance? And then one we haven't mentioned, and that is, does that farm family have a livestock or animal enterprise? The animal industry is really going to get hit hard. Joe can talk a little bit more about that from his personal family situation they have none of these compensations. So the animal sector, we do have to remember them. Jay. Thanks much, uh, Chris. And again, we'll have some time for questions. Joe, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, your, your observations on how this is going to play around our state. Well, appreciate it, Jay. Thanks for uh, having me be a part of this. And uh, this has been a really exciting kind of uh, phenomenon to kind of watch unfold and, and maybe exciting in the right term. But it's, it's certainly been uh, at the top of mind uh, for many of us, for more of us than usually pay attention, and I look forward to this kind of report um, uh, every year, uh, but many of us uh, maybe uh, let it go by, as, as, as Jay has mentioned. But I might start with kind of a, a bit of a history lesson early in the year. If, if you'll imagine putting yourself in the, the position of the farmer when uh, we had a relatively warm uh, and, and nice winter um, that allowed for early conditions to become very favorable for early planting. 
Uh, the first day uh, that you can get crop insurance or be, be eligible for crop insurance is April 6th. And there were folks that were unheard of thinking about, and maybe some did, plant corn in March. Uh, in this part of the country, just something that does not happen because conditions were so favorable uh, that they were, they were looking forward to that. We had a lot of acres that went to corn. A lot of great conditions putting that crop in. And expectations were really high uh, for yield, for success. Uh, as measured by, uh, by uh, uh, total yield, total output for this state and much of the region uh, as, as we looked at. And as time has gone on, those high hopes uh, have been diminished further and further and further as, uh, as made apparent by the map and by the numbers we've seen today. And, and we've seen that happen uh, or that phenomenon kind of manifest itself in changes in the market. And uh, as those market prices have increased, um, the market is a great collection, a consolidation of all the information that's available um, and, and quantifies it into a number. And so uh, while up until now we, the market kind of digests all that's out there, and this piece of information that we've uh, been able to, to partake in this morning um, is either at market expectation, where we've had little price uh, change, and my best update here is we're almost flat with corn, uh, down two is my latest number. So that means that the corn yield was about what the market expected. And now then we have this new information, now people's actions are gonna come into play. So what does that mean? If we now know uh, our best piece of information is the yields that we've seen today, uh, what now do we do? As livestock producers, we make decisions to uh, buy and hedge our, our, our feed needs going forward. Uh, do we reduce our herds because uh, we feel like that there's not much chance of, uh, of profitability in the short term? Uh, do our export friends uh, find that $8 and change is a real bargain, or do they find that to be uh, too expensive and it rations demand, as, as uh, Dr. Hurd spoke of? Uh, those will be kinds of the stories and the kinds of things we'll be watching as we, as we go forward. Um, it certainly is a, a time of decision and a time of, uh, of um, forecasting, frankly, for, for our livestock friends. Our crop, uh, uh, um, the folks that just grow crops, you know, plant this, most of the corn soybeans, plant in the spring, harvest in the fall, uh, and market then in the, in the off time. Whereas the livestock folks have to harvest this fall and then maybe buy some or, or grow their own, but that feedstock is now their supply of feed for the next 12, 16, 18 months. And if there are quantity concerns, which we clearly have, uh, or there are quality concerns, which was mentioned too as well, uh, we have animal performance concerns. And so those kinds of things will be a reality uh, that our livestock friends will have to uh, really try to work with and, and deal with and mitigate uh, in the coming months that, that becomes a longer term kind of impact uh, than just what happens this fall. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be going forward. Um, as I think about uh, kind of what does this mean? Why does anybody care about this? And, and if anything, this has been a really, uh, in my professional lifetime anyway, uh, the level of interest in uh, what's going on on the farm and how this weather phenomenon is affecting all of us has created a great opportunity for us and agriculture uh, to really reach out to our, across the fence, to our non-farm neighbors um, to help um, talk about the kinds of impacts that our farm activities the kinds of risks that we take with weather uh, and biology and pests and all the things that uh, become uh, what farmers think about and do every year uh, to share with their non-farm neighbors, hey, this is why this matters to you. This is why it might affect uh, your livelihood, your opportunity, uh, because it's bigger, much bigger than just what's happening on the farm. And uh, this has been, uh, whether it be local media, the ag media, it's also international media. Uh, the handful of uh, international guests uh, reporters, uh, folks that have visited in the last several months, the story is, um, how about this drought? How does it affect the United States? Uh, how does it affect our supplies? Um, what does it mean for uh, our food supply, our fuel supply, our fiber supply, and what does it mean for the, for, for the coming years? Now, some of that information, we're gonna find out. I mean, it's gonna be unfolding uh, as we go forward. Um, but certainly, it offers a great opportunity for us to learn and understand and, and realize how really interdependent uh, we are on this uh, very basic, very important mainstay of Indiana's agriculture or Indiana's economy, and that is agriculture. So um, appreciate the chance to kind of see these numbers today. Um, I, I uh, uh, on our own farm, have been out in a couple of fields, and uh, usually we'll run between, oh, and corn, maybe 150 to 160 bushels in one field at 38, one field at 80, 
And so these numbers seem sadly uh, very realistic to me, and, and uh, I hope not to higher than what Buck will have. But uh, again, I think uh, Dr. Hurt uh, mentioned some of the natural hedge uh, items as well as crop insurance. Another thing important I think to, to talk about when, we, when you get to crop insurance is the payment schedule that that happens. As you think about those farm families expecting revenues to, to hit their cash flow uh, for, their, for their business planning um, would happen at the sale of the grain that might happen into the fall and into the winter. Where in reality is with crop insurance because of the need to quantify losses and process these claims, um, that payment may be delayed and may be delayed as much as uh, into uh, late spring, uh, early summer next year. And if you think about trying to uh, finance a, a farm business that has uh, costs per acre at six and seven hundred dollars and who knows what uh, as, as we go forward, um, we could get into some, some issues uh, with that as well. So um, certainly not out of the woods as far as um, what this might mean and how farm families and, and agribusinesses and rural economies going to have to really accept this, uh, but it's something that uh, we'll, we'll get through, and American agriculture, Indiana agriculture, has uh, solved uh, so many problems in the past, has endured uh, so many other challenges in the past, and, and uh, we'll look forward to a, a, another year next year uh, where we'll have uh, maybe better news to share. Thanks much, Joe. I'm, I'm going to ask one question, and then we'll see what kinds of questions our audience uh, may have. But uh, uh, Chris, an obvious question is, you know, what might the implications be for food prices moving forward? And maybe you could comment on that one, and then we'll see what questions are on our audience's mind. Uh, sure. And again, it's been a very common question, uh, especially from more urban uh, reporters. Uh, that's where they see it for uh, the group that they're uh, writing for. Uh, this year, we're uh, probably going to be up about uh, uh, three and a half percent on food prices uh, for 2012. Remember, the impacts of the drought really couldn't even have gotten in until about the last six, seven weeks, two months at the most. So we basically had half the year in that there was no impact of the drought because it wasn't in place. Uh, for next year, USDA is using a 3 to 4 percent increase in food prices. So uh, we can put together now uh, three years. Uh, last year, 11 was 3.7. We think this year will be about 3.5, 3 to 4 percent next year. A um, little bit uh, iffy on those numbers for next year, but clearly uh, one of the important uh, parts of this, as the pain starts to get cast around uh, for this drought. The drought is what caused the pain. The drought is what caused the losses. And how those get allocated out around the country and around the world um, is, you know, it's kind of the distribution we talk about that of, of how it gets allocated out. Ultimately, consumers will pay uh, for these losses, and the consumers pay in the form of food prices and consumers pay in the form of fuel prices. And of course our urban uh, uh, reporters say, wait a minute, what's the connection to gasoline price? And uh, in agriculture we know the connection, it's ethanol. And so uh, ethanol is roughly 60 cents higher a gallon due to the drought. Uh, since corn prices have gone up, ethanol has gone up. And if, you, if we blend about 10 percent ethanol uh, into our gasoline, so 10% of what we buy is ethanol. So that means about 10% uh, of the 60 cents, around six cents a gallon. Uh, over an, a year, if you say that's the impact over a year, that's about $8 billion uh, across the country. And again, when you look at our big U.S. economy, that doesn't seem like much. But here's where we get the billions of dollars allocated out and who is going to pay for that. Uh, so on the unfortunate side of food prices, is that uh, those prices have gone up for now three, what will be three years at above the income rate of increase. So that means for uh, our American families, it is cutting into uh, that paycheck, the disposable income in that paycheck. And uh, you know, ever so little bit, it would even have some slightly negative impact on our general economy because food's a necessity, it leaves less money to go to other directions. Again, that's. Uh, not a not a large amount, but this is tens of billions of dollars. We don't know the full impact. The 88 drought's been estimated around 80 billion dollars. We've heard some estimates this could be worse. We'll just have to see. But I think we're up in those kind of numbers. Uh, you know, 7,500 billion dollars of impact that will get spun out uh, to consumers around the world. Jay. 
So questions, audiences. Mike? Yeah, Chris, if you don't mind, re repeat uh, the question. Yeah, repeat, just. Uh, sure. Uh, the question was, what does this mean for the ethanol industry? Um, and again, as we, Joe and I both were reflecting here, uh, we don't fully know who is going to uh, bear the biggest brunt of the cost. Uh, we'll start with the official uh, numbers, that being the U.S. Department of Agriculture today said that the ethanol industry will reduce their usage of ethanol by 10% from 5 billion bushels of corn would be what they used for the 11 crop and that's what we were anticipating for the 12 crop and they're going to drop that to 4.5 billion. Now USDA um, has some assumptions they made uh, and again I think these would all be subject to question whether that will be the case. Uh, they, they actually dropped the exports 16% from last year, and they dropped feed use by 11%. So those would be the big, the big players. Uh, on the ethanol side, um, the ethanol industry, uh, fir first point is that uh, et the price of ethanol is still cheaper than the price of gasoline. So as long as ethanol prices are below the price of gasoline, uh, the retailers, the, the refiners and, and blenders and retailers of gasoline have, have every incentive to continue to use the same amount of ethanol. And that would be up to the blend wall, which is at 10% of the ethanol. So um, the mandate uh, that EPA, the there's been a petition by the animal industry to have the EPA uh, consider reducing the ethanol mandate for next year, which is 13.8 billion gallons of ethanol. Again, the mandate is that the, the law of the United States says that that would be the minimum amount of ethanol that would have to be blended into gasoline. It's 13.2 this year billion gallons, 13.8 billion gallons next year. So one of the questions is, if, if EPA would reduce the mandate, that only establishes a minimum amount of ethanol. That doesn't establish the maximum amount. The maximum amount is determined by the blend wall, which is about 10%, is the 10% that they can blend in and the amount of E85 they can sell. Um, and then what really determines how much they'll use is the economics of the uh, oil refiners and the blenders and as long as ethanol prices are below gasoline they have every incentive to keep using just as much so I think this is a new area it's another one of these events that we have now that we need major cutbacks and we have no historical basis we can look back to and say we know how that industry behaves but the argument would be that if you're going to get the ethanol industry to really cut back, you're going to have to see corn prices go higher that will pull ethanol prices up above gasoline prices. And even as we've worked with some of the oil industry to find out what their economics are, some of them are saying we're not going to change even if ethanol gets a little bit higher than gasoline because we now formulate 87 octane by making 84 octane at the refinery, blending that with 115 octane, 10% 115 octane, gives us what you and I buy, regular gas, 87 octane. That is what we do today. That is our formula. Ethanol is going to have to be substantially higher priced than gasoline before we would change our formula. So that's uh, a long explanation to say it's not as clear as it seems, as some have said, if the ethanol industry, or excuse me, EPA would just lower the mandate, that automatically will lower the amount of corn we use for ethanol. So I think we're leaving this in a category of saying there's still going to have to be evolution in terms of finding out what the economics is for the oil industry, finding out, thinking about. Our guess is that our foreign customers are not going to back off as much as what USDA says, 16%. We're looking for them to be more 7 or 8% reduction. 
Joe's shaking his head here because he knows normally it's the livestock industry. Our guess is 17, 18% reduction in corn that goes to the, the uh, livestock industry. Now again, we don't know. We don't know how all this is going to work. So it's a great question without much of a very convincing answer. Another question? Yes, please. And I'll come back to Tom. Yeah. I just wanted to double check things right at the general numbers, right? We're saying USDA uh, nationwide corn reduction is down this year 13 percent, and in Indiana we're saying 28 percent. And for soybean, we're projecting production will be down 12 percent here in Indiana, up to 24 percent. Can you confirm that, Greg? Uh, down 22 percent. So everything else is correct. 24 percent. Do you have a question? Chris. Clarify, I got a question, but I thought down more. How much is over down? Down from last year. Down from last year. Soybeans was down 22% from last year. Corn, Indiana. Corn was down 28%, soybeans 22%. U.S. level, corn down 13% from last year. Soybeans down 12% from last year. Is that course, production or yield? That's production. production. Total production. That's total production. Last year. So if we're talking from the trend, it's a lot bigger percentage. Bigger. We had a poor yeah. crop last year. Okay. So when you're talking from last year, that's not from trend. We were 147 last year, right? That's Greg? correct, 147. And we should have been about 164, 165. So we had a port, so if you're from trend, it's a lot more off of trend. Chris, Chris what, how do you think the market will react to this report as far as the Well, Joe's got the market up here, so it, the market is trading through this report. Joe, what's that? <laughs> well, let's see, these are 10 minute delays, so uh, not the latest uh, up to date, but- Come uh, on, get better looks, technology. I, I know, I know, you have to pay for that. Um, <laughs> It's, it's showing really uh, uh, corn corn down to December corn down two cents and uh, November beans up seventeen and a half. Um, I would say you know honestly the prices that we're at now I call that almost unchanged. I mean it's it's really at a point where those those are not that big of moves for a big report like this. So so I would interpret that as the market kind of expected uh, the kind of report the kind of numbers we're seeing. Maybe not so much so in, in soybeans, but. Uh, but corn. Yeah, and I, I thought sure. the numbers were, the production was somewhat lower, but in the ballpark, but it was certainly in the range of guesses without question, but somewhat lower than the, the mean. And again, I'm a little surprised that on the corn, and let me just give you a range, USDA's range on corn for US average price. I said 820 is the midpoint. They have a 750 to 890. So USDA is saying, depend on how this works out, you could be as high as $9 as a yearly average price. So again, I, I think there's upside uh, in this uh, number, uh, and I would uh, still say I think $9 corn is not out of the question. And uh, we also want to see when the pit uh, trading opens, this would be electronic overnight, uh, not nearly as much activity as the pit trading. Very final question. Yeah, um, we'll make it Gary. Gary? Dr. Hur, could you speak on the international side of this? Uh, what does this, these numbers mean for world production and particularly the carry out uh, that's going to be and that we're done with the projections there? Uh, sure. And in, in terms of uh, thinking about the world, you know, we've, we've started talking about our Indiana producers, but uh, we, as Joe has indicated, reach the world without question uh, here in Indiana and across the United States. The United States is the largest supplier of basic food ingredients to the world. So we're the number one exporter of corn, soybeans, wheat. Those are the three really largest crops in the United States. We're the largest exporters of sorghum and even cotton. Now again, cotton is not relevant to the grains here today. But so of uh, these basic food products, uh, we influence the world greatly. World, all these big world trade, uh, traded commodities are all traded in U.S. dollars because the U.S. is the big, uh, big uh, uh, component of that world market. Um, so what happens uh, here in the direction of 
food availability and food supply uh, gets spun out uh, into the world. Uh, so we do have, uh, again, rising concern, and this report will not quell any concerns about two things. One is sheer availability of basic foodstuffs in the world. And the second is, what will the price of those basic foodstuffs be out in the world? Again, we don't worry uh, excessively about the wealthy countries, the Japan that buys a lot of goods from us. They're going to buy, Japan's one of our major corn buyers, they're going to buy about the same amount of corn as they would. They have, it'll cost them a little bit more in their food, but it won't be substantial. So it is the lowest income uh, uh, people in the world that have the biggest impact, and that is to raise uh, their cost of their food and you have to uh, remember that they're eating closer to the commodity. They're eating closer to a direct corn product uh, in uh, uh, some kind of a, a corn tortilla or something like that. Uh, they're eating closer to the bread or they're eating rice. Now again, rice is not uh, an important part of what we're discussing here today. So when those prices of that basic commodity go up, it really affects their incomes. So the United Nations is out, the World Food uh, Organization, uh, with concern about what this means for the world, concern for availability, concern for um, will there be the most marginal income, lowest income people of the world, uh, will it mean not only financial difficulty for those families, but even the concern about lack of food availability. So we handle that with food aid, but as you look at food aid and organizations that work with that, it just costs a lot more to get these basic commodities, whatever, if they've got a, you know, hundred million dollars, it just doesn't buy as much volume. So there is concern. Um, again, it is the drought that caused the problems, it's the drought that caused the losses, but those are, those are really felt most heavily by uh, our people in the United States with the more, most uh, marginal, lowest incomes, as well as out in the world. So. Uh, we, don't, we don't like that side, and as Joe has clearly told us, producers want to feed the world. This is what they want to do. They take great pride in that in this country, and, and uh, this is a year where, as a producer, you couldn't do anything about it. They did everything they can, and now we've got to deal with uh, what we've got. So let me give David one shot here, so a quick one. For Bob and Sean, the seed production kind of concerns me, and I've heard some real bad news about seed for next year. Quick comment on seed. Yeah, from the corn side, a couple of things. The year before was also not good. And, and, and that plus the increased corn acreage this year really reduced the inventory, the carryover inventory of seed corn. So yeah, there is a concern, especially dry land uh, seed corn production. And there's still a fair amount of that, even though a lot of it's gone to irrigation. So the word I'm getting through the seed industry is that first of all, there will be enough seed. But as you might imagine, there won't be enough seed of every hybrid. And so the hybrids that you want, you know, there may not be enough of. So, um, and there, there may or may not be some quality issues because much like the quality concerns we worry about in commercial corn because of drought, there might be similar issues with seed corn. So I think from, from corn's perspective, the, the bottom line is, is talk to your seed corn rep early and often and just stay on top of it. There will be South American production like there always is. And, and, and apparently that's been 100% booked from the get-go because of the year before. So, you know, if, if there's good weather in South America over the winter, you know, we'll have more seed corn coming back in, which will help. So it's, it's you know, again, it's very uncertain, and I think it certainly is worth visiting with your seed rep early. I think the same, same kind of trend in terms of the soybeans, but we might have a little bit more of a window because, uh, again, we're at that point where yield overall, just general production, we still don't know for sure. We've got time. So for the seed production, I think that it's the same kind of scenario. If the rains continue, we can have a good supply. One thing I would uh, be on the lookout for is a lot of these fields, if they had heat stress during seed fill, that can affect the quality. So I'm talking about germ scores, uh, vigor. So that's something to be on the lookout for next year. In terms of the quantities, I think we should be okay. But again, fairly similar. There might be some varieties in particular you might not be able to get all that you want. 
So just a very quick recap. Uh, Bob, of course, has talked about the yield impact, but also, Bob, we're a ways from getting this crop in the bin yet because of all the things you pointed out. Quality is a concern as we look to harvest. Uh, Sean tells us that uh, with some rains, uh, the soybeans still have a bit of upside, which we're certainly uh, hope for. We'll see some of that moisture coming up. Uh, Chris, the variability is a key word, I think, as we look forward and, and where these impacts are going to settle out and even variability in the state. And, and Joe, a key word is resilience of our Indiana farmers as we look forward to working through this and, uh, and again, getting ready for next year. And, and appreciate Joe reminding us of that. Uh, for those of you interested, Purdue Extension has got an extensive website. If you type Purdue and Drought, you'll find a lot of resources that Extension educators and our specialists have made available there. And I'd, I'd, I'd point you to that website as a resource. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists this morning.